In this episode, we get ready to do some bench work. Uh, this bench work here, we're going to work from the south and head our way north while taking a look at a Wisconsin Central decal, or decal. We rail fan the Minnesota commercial. We join Bob Rivard and Huey Lewis to go back in time. I'll be back in time. And also check out what the curmudgeon's gripe of the week is this week. Only in this episode of Sue the Milwaukee Road. All right, this week we're going to take a look at the bench work. Uh, this bench work here, we're going to work from the south and head our way north. I am going to address how I did the bench work and track laying and putting in servos on the northern end so you can kind of get an idea of where this is going to be going. We won't dive into all those details in this particular episode because the amount of time that it takes to actually do all the work is much more time consuming than it is for you to watch all the work. So we're going to speed things up, clean things up, and uh, get ready to take a look at the bench work. I acquired an original Wisconsin Central Limited shield and well, it needed to get mounted. She had big size. I acquired a sheet of 16 gauge steel from Metal Supermarkets in Roseville, Minnesota for 30 bucks. For steel? The Sioux Line received two extended vision cabooses built in 1975 for the Milwaukee Road. They were originally assigned to the Milwaukee Road Pool Service with the Burlington Northern on the Montana to Wisconsin unit coal trains. Number 163? Well, it was X Milwaukee Road, number 992301. While you sit on your caboose, can you figure out who actually built this caboose? Was it A, the Pacific Car and Foundry Company, B, the International Car Company, C, the Missouri Car and Foundry, or D, Barney and Smith Car Company? We'll find out later in this episode. For some, tackling projects like this can be a little intimidating, but one thing you want to make sure? Safety first. I am using a metal bit and a DeWalt jigsaw, and while those little metal shavings go flying around, you don't want to catch it in the old eyeball. One thing to also make sure you got is ear protection. Make sure you can hear later on. What's that? You might look like a dingus, but at least you can see and hear. Like butter. Beautiful. I highly recommend going around the entire shield with a file to be able to take off the sharp edge. Now it's time to get the logo mounted, and there's a few simple steps to be able to get this done. First things first is using Dawn dish soap to degrease the metal if there's any oils or anything on the surface. You want to make sure that you wash those as clean as possible so you get good adhesion with the actual decal. I thought it was decal. It's decal. Haha, <laughs> he told you! I end up using Johnson's baby soap mixed in a spray bottle and lightly mist it onto the surface of the metal to be able to allow the decal to be reapplied or adjusted while it was set to the metal. If you don't do this, it could stick and be stuck without being able to make an adjustment. Another nice thing to have on hand is a flexible straight edge that you can help burnish the decal onto the metal. Once we've pulled that protective clear backing off the decal, it is now laying on the metal and it's time to get it set. Ooh, here's a 10 second tip. Preserve vintage decals by storing them in a safe flat place, in this case between two pieces of glass, and better yet, frame it up for future generations to enjoy. Here's where we're burnishing out and actually getting all the air bubbles worked from the center out. Center to the outer perimeter gets rid of the air bubbles and squeezes out any excess water. We're going to remove the front protective layer, and while doing so, you want to do this in a slow process. As a decal ages, a lot of times you're going to find that this sticker will get stuck to the surface. The slower you go, the better the results. Do you always nudge the person next to you or just say to yourself, boy, why does he lob these cookies in here all the time on the quiz questions? Well, we try to keep them as difficult as possible because more often than not, you probably won't get the answer. Who knows this former Milwaukee Road caboose was built by... Did you guess A, the Pacific Car and Foundry? I guess every week. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Well, you'd be correct. Pack Car was located in Renton, Washington, and these cabooses were nearly identical to the sister Burlington Northern cabooses built at the time. Gee, I wonder why. Surprise, surprise, the end was near. Well, technically, 1975 is when they are built, and it actually didn't get merged until 1985, so, well, you know, do the math. All right, we've got everything cleaned up and uh, what we're gonna actually focus on here is looking at the bench work. Uh, the first thing we're gonna look at is actually the foundation and that's gonna be 
any different options that you might have. I know this is technically a shelf railroad, so you could use a bracket system um, that would just cantilever out and, and support your railroad, so you do have that. I was looking for something that was gonna be more aesthetically pleasing, so I ended up building these, um, these custom shelves uh, all the way around the railroad to be able to support the railroad. So uh, we're gonna look at the actual foundation of um, the bench work itself and what, what I use. There we go, we've got the eight foot section, 13 inches deep. Uh, it is constructed of homosote and plywood, so half inch homosote, half inch plywood, and a one by two for the, the bracing around the perimeter. Now, um, for fastening, I am using um, just traditional screws. In this case, it's just a general construction screw. Uh, I'm using a square head uh, or a star bit. That ends up being just a lot easier to get in and out so you don't strip it out if you are using uh, Phillips. They can strip out. But what we're looking at here is the track work. And as you can see, it's not nailed down. Uh, none of this is really nailed down. It's just temporarily tacked in place to give myself an idea of where I want to put stuff. Reason being is I'm going to mark where the turnouts are and then I'm going to install the servos underneath. So here's the underside. Obviously it's all open. I didn't put my cross supports in just yet because I left the areas open to make sure that I didn't have a cross support where a turnout got laid. Um, I'm gonna be able to then look now where my turnouts are and line up and put my, my support brace in a place where it's not gonna affect a servo um, because that can be frustrating. So thinking ahead, planning ahead, one by two construction. These one by twos will obviously go across here and support. They'll rest then on the top of the framework of the bookcases and we got ourselves a shelf railroad. So as I'm gonna drop this back in place, I do wanna note that the railroad itself is made to come apart in those three sections. It's this section, it's the section on the north end, and then this corner. The reason being is if I decide to take this out, uh, and I think long-term plan is the width of the north end and the south end, they do line up. So if I end up in a home that I have a 25 foot stretch, these two sections can be then set end to end, and then I just have to relocate and figure out um, this portion of the railroad uh, by having it obviously missing. I'll be able to segment that back in, and we've got a railroad that's still usable. So that's the plan, that's the future. That is how I'm handling bench work. We'll look forward to uh, the possibility of what I do with track work and how I uh, end up actually modifying the switches to be able to work in, uh, I guess, a real nice, unique way. One of my favorite things around the Twin Cities is actually to rail fan the Minnesota commercial. If you're ever in the Minneapolis Twin Cities area, it's definitely worth checking out this particular railroad because, well, they're kind of like a museum on rails. Today, they're going to be running a pair of GE B398Es, which are former LMX locomotives, built in 1988 and acquired by the M&R in 2012. In this footage, we see them working next to the bell, lumber, and pole. One thing to note about this particular clip, the horn on number 58. She sounds like a real beaut. That's a real beaut, you hoser. <laughs> the Minnesota Commercial Railway is the successor to the Minnesota Transfer Railway, which existed from 1883 to 1987. The commercial is obviously running from 1987 to the present day, so we might as well kick back and watch them work. this up just a scotch. This train is heading southbound. It is actually crossing the Canadian National, which was the former Wisconsin Central, which was the former Sioux Line. Speaking of things former, here's a former Tropicana car. It's a Reaper. Dude, that's awesome.
Well, that concludes some of my favorite things in today's railroad world. We're going to actually turn back the clock to that footage that Bob had captured in the Hiawatha Elevated District in 1985. We'll pick up where he left off, and that was the crew telling him, Hey, Bob, we're going the other way. To give you some perspective as to where Bob was standing when he filmed the footage that we're about to view, he was standing on 35th Street in South Minneapolis. As we pull back, you ask, where's Minneapolis? It's right up there in the upper left-hand corner. So we might as well zoom in and kick back to watch the MP15 doing a little work in South Minneapolis. <laughs> As we observe a few things in this scene, on the left hand side you are seeing the yard office that is located just outside of Elevator T. The crew member has just thrown one of the Milwaukee Road switch stands. It is a 180 degree throw. If you're looking for these in HO scale, Lines West creates a very nice looking model of it. You can also note the track. Not so smooth. some of this vintage footage is checking out the vintage vehicles. Well, I mean, they weren't vintage at the time, that's just what people were driving. But to take in those details, to see the colors of the cars and see the look of the surrounding environment, it helps us as modelers just get that much more accurate when you're looking at the prototype modeling side of things. So, as we wrap up this particular bit of footage that Bob has shared with us, that is the remainder of my favorite things. Well, at least this week, we'll look forward to more footage in future episodes of Sue the Milwaukee Road. All right, here's the curmudgeon scribe of the week. This week is about operations and people are complaining about, oh, why do you always talk about operations? Because operations give you railroad a purpose. I'm telling you right now, you treat it like a board game. You have your own game pieces. You have your own rules. You set it up and you can see if this game actually works when you invite complete strangers over. And if it works, you got a successful game. That's all there is to it. And that's the curmudgeon scribe of the week. Oh, why do you always talk about operations? <laughs> A big thanks to everybody that watches to the end that has hit like, hit subscribe, as well as made comments in the past. It's those actions that help share this content, so if you haven't checked out other episodes, feel free to do so. You can also check out the tour of the GN in 1970, as well as the past episodes of the GN in 1970. 70s. Oh, why do you always talk about operations? <laughs>